Hey y'all, I'm Lauren and welcome to Cantina Cast. Today I'm kicking off a series of videos that I'm going to be contributing to over the next several months leading up to the release of the Ahsoka series on Disney+. Plus. In between new releases, I'm going to be looking at canon materials that relate somehow to either the events that we might see in the Ahsoka series or the characters in the Ahsoka series. As of right now, we don't have tons of information about the show yet. But one of the things that we do know about the show is that Hera is going to be a character. And so because of that, I thought now would be a great time to revisit A New Dawn by John Jackson Miller. A New Dawn was first released back in 2014, so it was like the first canon novel that was released since Disney purchased Lucasfilm. And John Jackson Miller has written a lot of really great Star Wars books, so it's like no surprise that this book is another great one of his. And so since Hera is heavily featured as one of the main characters of this book, I figured that this one would just be a great one to start with. And this video is just the first one of a few that I'm planning on doing in part of this series. So if you want to see what other ones I'm planning to do, check out my Instagram. That's where I post whatever stuff I'm getting ready to cover next. And my Instagram is just Lauren Cover Star Wars, just all one word. And so getting into just kind of like a general summary of this book. So you're going to know Hera probably much more from Rebels, which of course is a widely beloved animated show. And this that show does get really into Hera's character, but this book is just like another way that you can also explore some more of her backstory. This book, it does take place in the timeline shortly before the start of Rebels, and it actually was published before Rebels as well. So it was kind of like at the time it was intended as a way to get people interested in the show that was going to come out. So in this book, we are seeing how Hera and Kanan meet up, how they end up working together, um, kind of like what spurs Kanan into action as well in terms of fighting back against the Empire. And we're also seeing how Hera, she was like kind of one of the first people at this point that was really starting to try to get people together to resist the Empire. And Kanan at the beginning of this book, he is in a place where he is really trying to not get involved. After surviving Order 66, he's like, I'm done with this. I don't really want to like get in the Empire's way. I'm just trying to keep my head down and survive. But once he does meet Hera and some of the events that transpire during that time, he does get to a point to where he's like, at least kind of starts budging on that, even though he still, of course, has like a long way to go in terms of what he's um, like, how involved he's willing to get. But he does at least, like, in this book, it's the start of him coming to that. And some pretty big things happen with his character to where he real he's, you know, starting to recognize the fact that, like, he can't just, like, 100% sit back and let everything happen the way that it's been happening. And so as the Empire is growing bolder in their methods, as we're seeing happen in this book, Hera and Kanan, they do end up working together to try to resist it as much as they can. So that's like a very quick kind of like general what you can expect from this book. If you haven't read it yet and you don't want to hear spoilers, if you're planning on reading it, now is your time to turn back. I'm about to start getting into some more plot details and talking about spoilers as the story goes on. The book opens up with Kanan as a child who his name, his given name was Caleb Doom. And he doesn't adopt the name Kanan until after Order 66. But we see him as Caleb. He's a Padawan in the Jedi Temple. And he's in a lesson where Obi-Wan Kenobi is explaining to the kids how the Jedi beacon works. And how its function is to call the Jedi back to Coruscant if there's ever an emergency where they need all the Jedi to come get together. And during this lesson, Caleb actually asks, would you ever use the beacon to deter the Jedi like to tell them to go away and Obi-Wan's kind of like uh, I guess I could like it's not really its function but it in theory it could work that way and of course we know that later on once Order 66 happens that's exactly what Obi-Wan does so then we jump forward in time to like the present time of this book which is post Order 66 the Empire is in power and 
they are getting stronger by the day. And during this time, Kanan, as an adult, he is kind of just working odd jobs. He's not really staying in the same place for a super long time. He's just sort of like jumping around, trying to fly under the radar. He is not living as a Jedi. He pretty much doesn't view himself as a Jedi, and he doesn't take the Jedi code seriously or anything like that. He more so just views that time of his life as the past, and he's not interested in digging it up. Right now, he's working a job on the planet Gorse, where he's he's involved in mining and he is also like a pilot as well. So like ferrying people to and from the moon of Gorse called Cinda, where a lot of the mining is going on. So he's set up a bit of a life for himself there. He has a best friend named Ocadia and he, he's like a regular at the bar that Ocadia owns. And he seems like he's like do, doing as all right for himself as a former Jedi could do during this time. But the Empire is increasing their presence on Gorse right now. And the reason for that is because the miners on Gorse, the output of how much they're actually mining from the moon, it's not as high as the Empire wants it to be. And so the Empire sends an official who kind of specializes in productivity. And his name is Count Vidian horrible, horrible person, even for an Imperial. Like, there's stuff that he does that even other Imperials are like, wow, that was kind of a lot. As soon as he gets in there, he's firing elderly people. He's closing medical centers. He's beating people up in, like, a rage. Clearly has no regard for the worker's safety. He does not care about if decisions that he's making are endangering the miners. That is, like, not of relevance to him at all. The only thing he cares about is hitting the targets that the emperor is setting out. And also to make him even more freaky, he is mostly machine at this point. Another key character that we meet in this book is Skelly. And Skelly, he's like a kooky conspiracy theorist that lives in a bomb shelter. And through a bunch of research that he's done, he has realized that if the empire keeps mining on the moon in the way that they have been doing, it's actually going to cause it to explode. Skelly is really trying to get it through to the Empire that if you keep going the way that you're going, there's going to be real consequences. And Skelly ends up telling his supervisor, Lal, about this. And through Imperial surveillance, the Empire finds out that Skelly is going around telling people this and trying to get the Empire's attention. And they view this as speaking against the Empire, and so they're going to arrest him. He does manage to avoid arrest, though, and he ends up planting a bomb on Cinda, which is supposed to be part of his testing research. For See, this is how, this is how you know that this character is like, this is not a stable person, because <laughs> he's worried about the moon getting blown up. But to, um, like, try to test the theory, he's, like, setting explosives off on the moon, so... That's just, that is who Skelly is. He he does not think things through. And he's very much the type of person that will, he will set a bomb off before he like actually thinks through what are the consequences going to be of me doing that. And this bomb goes off where Kanan and his crew of mining co-workers that he has are currently on a shift. And so Kanan and everybody ends up having to like escape from where they currently are so they don't die in the explosion. And they all like barely get out with their lives. And at one point, Kanan actually does run into Skelly again. And when this happens, Kanan's like immediately like, I'm going to turn you in. Because first of all, Kanan does not want to be on the Empire's bad side. He really, at this point, he is concerned with keeping his head down and like not making waves. So he's going to just try to do what he feels like is the right thing and turn Skelly in. And in addition to that, he also doesn't really feel any loyalty to Skelly anyway, because Skelly almost got him and his friends killed. But while Kanan feels this way about Skelly, we actually, we, we do see that at the same time, Hera is on her ship, the ghost, thinking about how this guy that set the explosives off, he seems like he might be a really good rebel that she could, uh, like, work with and get over to her cause. So she has no idea yet that Skelly is, like, delusional and like you know not really emotionally sound but she thinks that this guy might be a good potential contact so she wants to try to meet him and so she actually does 
once Skelly is later on taken into Imperial custody, she does end up planning a rescue for him. And during this rescue is when Kanan and Hera meet for the first time. So what she does is she stages a fight to happen outside of the place where Skelly is being kept. And in this fight, it's enough of a distraction to where she is able to rescue Skelly. And then during the fight, one of the people that Hera hired to stage the fight, they do end up actually turning on her and they try to rob her. And so Kanan sees this going on and he feels like Hera like needs some help. And so he steps in and gets the guys off her case, even though like she probably could have handled it without him. He saw someone who needed help and got involved. And then after this, once Hera actually gets a chance to talk to Skelly, that is when she realizes that this guy is like not going to be a good contact. And after this, Hera does go to the asteroid belt. That's Ocadia's cantina that he owns because she's supposed to meet a contact there that she met on the hollow net named Hedo. And who actually shows up instead of Hedo is Zaluna. Zaluna was like co-workers with Hedo and what happened is that Imperial Surveillance caught on to the fact that Hedo was feeling anti-Imperial and they arrested him. But when he was about to be arrested, he told Zaluna, there is a data cube in this like plant that I left, go pick it up. And when she does that, she gets information on the hollow cube that his contact that he was supposed to meet is Hera. And so Zaluna does go to meet Hera because Hedo was her friend. And so it is bothersome to her that Hedo was picked up by Imperial Surveillance. And part of the reason that it's bothersome to her, other than him just being her friend, is that Zaluna is one of the people that monitors the Imperial Surveillance. And so like she feels guilty because she's like, what am I doing? She got involved in the surveillance back in the days of the Republic when they were doing surveillance for a totally different reason. And now that she's starting to be personally affected by what the surveillance is being used for nowadays, she is a little bit more willing to get involved. And so all of that ends up leading Hera, Kanan, and Zaluna to the cantina where they're all having this meeting. And I loved this scene so much. It just, the whole time I was reading this scene, it just made me laugh because Zaluna and Hera are like trying to have like a serious conversation about like what the situation is and what's going on. And Kanan is just being like so obnoxious and just like flirting with Hera. And it, Hera's like, please stop. <laughs> Even though Kanan was being really obnoxious, this whole scene was just so endearing, especially because like, once you like watch Rebels and then come back and read the scene, it's just like, I don't know, it just makes you feel something. So I got a lot of enjoyment out of this scene. In this scene, Skelly also ends up coming to the cantina. Shortly after he gets there, stormtroopers arrive. And so Kanan, this is another thing that's really important about this scene too, other than just Kanan being funny, is you do see that Kanan thinks very quickly on his feet in this situation. He has Skelly get into the closet. And when the stormtroopers come looking, Kanan tells them that it's a Wookiee in the closet getting sick. So, and he's convincing enough to the stormtroopers that they do end up moving on. And Hera takes note of this because she's like, okay, this guy has really tried to like make a big show of like being a scoundrel and like not caring about anybody. But obviously he's like smarter than he's letting on because when the stormtroopers came in, he knew how to deal with these guys effectively. And so this is an example of how Hera has a really good read on people. Even though, because at this point, Kanan, he has been trying so hard to even convince himself that he doesn't care. Like in this book, when we're seeing kind of like inside of Kanan's thoughts, he believes the lie that he's telling, which is that I just want to keep my head down. I don't want to get involved. I don't care about helping people. But Hera can tell by watching Kanan and seeing how he actually handles things that that's not the case. So even though that Stormtrooper situation, it does end up getting handled, it does spook Zaluna pretty bad. And so she flees from the cantina and she's hiding and she's like, you know, she's freaked out because she's expecting that she's going to get in trouble. But before Zaluna ran off, 
one of the main pieces of information that Hera was able to get from her is that there was a mining consultant named Lemuel Parsa who was involved in a lot of imperial mining projects and also like some going further back into the days of the Republic. She can see that the Imperials that are currently occupying Gors, based on Zaluna's surveillance, they did recently look up Lemuel Farsa's name and like his records and all that. And so because of that, Hera's kind of putting together like, okay, so somehow Vidian must be connected to this guy because he seems to somehow be involved in whatever the Imperials mining um, goals are for this planet. And Hera's goal at this point is to continue to watch Vidian and to try to put together what exactly he's doing here because she feels like for him to come here now with the urgency that he came here and also for this Lemuel Farsa person to also be involved, she feels like there's got to be a purpose for it. Like, it's not just some random occurrence to her. And so we do see in this instance that Hera really is somebody who, when she sees something like this going on, she gets involved like she views it as her responsibility to get involved really she doesn't just let things like this go so after all of this even though the imperials are trying to hunt down skelly skelly believes because he is delusional he believes that if he is just able to talk to vidian then vidian's gonna understand what he's trying to say and he's gonna totally get it and it's all gonna be fine so he finally eventually does catch up to vidian and he explains the situation he gives his research over to him and vidian of course isn't buying it he just views skelly as an annoyance and he punches him out and takes his research and right around this time as well we do learn some more about vidian's motivations when it comes to the way that he's treating the mining operations on Gorse. So we do see that he's talking to someone who is a bit of a rival of his named Lero Danth. And Danth tells Vidian that the Emperor is now going to triple the requirements of how much they're mining here. And so that sends Vidian into just like a complete like spiral of de desperation because Tripling it is just, it's not physically possible. And so he doesn't know how he's going to keep this up. And of course, when Damp tells Vidian this, he's like, you can tell he's really smug about it because he knows that Vidian's not going to be able to keep up with it. And they're both kind of like trying to get ahead of each other, as often happens within the Imperial ranks, as we've seen in a lot of examples of TV shows and books and all sorts of stuff. So after this conversation with Vidian taking the news of the new requirements, he ends up like kind of he's beside himself at this point trying to figure out what he's going to do. And he ends up pushing Lau, who is one of the mining supervisors that was taking him on a tour of the facilities. He pushes her into a huge vat of acid and leaves her in there until she dies. During this time, Hera actually sees the whole thing and she has, because she was following Vidian too, and she has to break the news to Lal's husband. And that, of course, he doesn't take that well. And so now he's kind of like hellbent on getting vengeance against the Empire for the murder of his wife. And Hera, even though like you do get the sense that she's probably seen a lot, like you kind of get the sense because you can tell that she's not completely new to fighting she's not completely new to resisting the empire like this is not her first rodeo but you can tell that the way that Vidian kills Lau you can tell that this deeply affects her and there is a moment where right after so there's a moment where Kanan is about to get caught and Sloan one of the imperial captains has him in cuffs and Hera ends up coming up and talks him out of the situation and once she lets him go Hera's trying to explain to Kanan what she just saw, and she's having a hard time, like, getting the story out of what it is that she just witnessed. So you can just really see that this is something that is staying with her. But Hera and Kanan, they quickly have to move on to the next thing. So they're going to follow the Imperials back to the Ultimatum, which is their ship. And the reason that they're following them is because during that whole confrontation that Sloane had with Kanan, they overheard Vidian on Sloane's comm link saying 
Um, like I have a new strategy, get back to the ultimatum immediately. And so they're like, okay, well, we got to go track that down. But when they're in the process of doing that, there was another explosion set off by Skelly again. And in the wreckage of that explosion, Kanan does stop and he's trying to free people from the debris and stuff. And so that's another example of Hera noticing that there is something more to Kanan than he is letting on. And there is a moment where Hera does mention to Kanan, like he says something to her to the effect of, well, you're the only person that I'd stop and help. And she was like, I don't think I believe that because I've seen multiple instances of you helping people. So she's almost not willing to let Kanan keep up this facade of trying to be someone who doesn't care. And after that explosion happens, Hera and Kanan are trying to get away in the hover bus that they stole. And Skelly actually crashes into the side of it on this speeder bike that he was using to get away. Now they're all stuck there because they just had a wreck. And so the Imperials catch up, Skelly is wounded, and they end up do having a confrontation where they're having like a shootout with the Imperials and TIE fighters also show up too. But the reason that they're able to get away is because Gord, who is, that's Lal's husband's name, he's still hell-bent on getting vengeance. So he does show up. And so he's going after Vidian. And so now the attention is on him. And so the rest of them are able to get away. And unfortunately, Vidian does end up killing Gord because it was like, Gord really didn't stand a chance against him. The way that they get away is Skelly actually ends up driving the hover bus. And so Kanan and Hera are forced to go on the hover bus with Skelly because that's like their only way to get out of the situation. So that's how they end up working with Skelly going forward. They all eventually like are able to outrun the Imperials and they end up dumping the bus in like a pit, like a quarry type of thing. And when they're doing that, they find out that Zaluna was actually trapped in the bathroom the whole time on the bus. So when she comes out of the bathroom, they find out that the reason that she was in there is because the night before at the cantina, when Zaluna freaked out and ran away, she was looking for a hiding place and that's where she hid. And then she couldn't get out once she got in there. Now the four of them are all pretty much stuck together. So they're going to be like a team going forward for the rest of the book. And before they ditch the hover bus, Zaluna does end up getting the recording device because the Imperials were using this same hover bus like earlier in the day. And so she ends up looking through the recordings to try to get like any information that they can. And they end up finding a conversation where Vidian is saying his plans to blow up the moon, just like Skelly's research said. So even though Skelly was trying to get them to not blow up the moon, what happened was Vidian looked into the research and was like, oh, that's a great idea. Like, I think I'm going to blow it up on purpose because if I do that, then I'll be able to meet the emperor's targets that he set out. But before they can do this, the empire is going to conduct some tests first and see if this is even like an option. But when they start doing these tests, they don't tell anybody that they're doing it. So they do start bombing Cinda. And what happens is Ocadia and his crew, they are currently on shift on Cinda when that first test happens. Kanan immediately, he goes and runs and gets the, his ship, the Expedient, and they're all gonna, they're gonna try to go to Cinda, despite the fact that there was just a big explosion there, and they're gonna try to save those people that Kanan knew that were on shift. And at this point in the book, we do see Hera's flying skills are, I mean, she's really, she is a unique level of pilot because when they're flying to send a, Hera is really the, Kanan ends up giving her the controls because he's like, you're the only person that can pull this off. So I'm just going to let you do it. And it's true. Like she really is like, as far as flying goes, like there are very few people that I can think of that can fly as good as she can. So she does get them to Cinda successfully and they do find Ocadia who is about to die. Like it's at this point that it's, he's too wounded to be able to make it. And in his last moments, Hera and Kanan are there and Ocadia tells Hera in, in, you know, using only a few words because he doesn't have much time left. He does get the point across pretty much the same thing that Hera has already been suspecting about Kanan, which is that there is more to this guy than he pretends that there is. After Ocadia dies, they got to figure out what their next move is going to be. 
And there is a moment where Hera stops everybody and she's like, before we go forward, we need to make sure that everybody who is part of this mission from this point on is consenting to be part of this mission. Like, it's very important to her that people aren't just involved because they feel like they don't have a choice. And this is something that does set her apart. Like, if you're thinking about, like, Andor as an example, I'm that's just, like, a recent example that stood out to me is that, you know, in Andor, the perspective is very much about, like, the cause comes first. Individuals, if they're getting in the way of the cause, like, that's that's not important to a point. But Hera is very different in the way that she's, like, the cause is important, but I also care about the individual people that are involved in the cause. I don't want anyone to be here that doesn't want to be here. I don't want to force anyone to be here. And so that really is something that's special about her is that she does not let like her own passion for the cause and the importance of the cause. She doesn't let that get in the way of like her humanity and the way that she cares about trying to do right by others beating the empire is of the utmost importance to her and you can see that in the way that she is going about the situation throughout this book but she doesn't she she really really is trying to avoid doing that at the expense of other people and so everybody there they do all agree to stick with Hera and try to stop Fidian and they all pretty much what has happened is in the events so far everybody has had something happen that has forced them to not be able to sit back any longer. So they end up going to the Calcoran system, which is where the explosives are that are going to be used to blow up the moon. And so when they get there, they come up with an idea that they're going to falsify the test reports and make it sound like that blowing up the moon is actually going to be a disadvantage and it's going to be like a worse solution than just doing the normal mining. But when they all get to Vidian's lab, Hera and Kanan, they end up confronting him and like trying to attack him, but they do not last very long because this guy is like super strong with his like machinery capabilities that he has. He catches them and he's about to torture them and he brings in an interrogation droid. But as soon as he does, it turns out that this droid was sabotaged or like reprogrammed by Skelly. And what actually ends up happening is the droid injects Vidian with like meds that knock him out and so they are able to download all of the memories from his brain because his brain is like also has a lot of like machinery aspects to it they download those memories and they're looking through them to try to get the information that they need to falsify the report when they're doing that they find out that vidian is lemuel tharsa so that was vidian's old name before he ended up having to become a cyborg because of the illness that he had. So they're actually the same person. And Vidian just occasionally uses his old name in order to give credibility to his ideas that aren't that credible. Like a key example of this is he uses that name to sign off on what is actually a fake report already, which is that the testing was successful pretty much what happened was the true test like the actual results of the test showed that bombing the moon would not be a good long-term solution because all of the stuff that they're trying to mine would end up disintegrating over time and so it would only last for like a year but Vidian ended up faking it and saying that the testing was successful because for the next year, Vidian wants to meet those targets that the Emperor set out. But after a year, he's not planning on being there anymore. It's actually going to be his rival, Danth, who will be responsible for it at that point. And when they find out that they were already falsified, they end up getting the real results and trying to give them to Captain Sloan. And so what Kanan does is he pretends to be an agent of the Emperor gives them to Sloan and is like, deliver these to the Emperor. These are the actual results. Vidian is still planning on going through with the detonation. So they end up going to the ship, the Forager, which is like an Imperial mining ship. And they end up being able to dock on it. And they're making their way, like fighting their way through the ship, trying to get to Vidian. During all of this fighting, Skelly is shot at. And so 
he does end up when he's shot at he takes a pretty bad fall like he falls like a long way and skelly was already wounded before the fall to the point to where they were wondering if he was going to make it so when this fall happens they pretty much have to accept the fact that he has passed when they do get to vidian zaluna ends up getting caught by vidian and is badly burned so zaluna is really wounded now as well Kanan and Hera are trying to hold their own against Vidian, and there is a moment where I was like, I really thought that Kanan was going to take his lightsaber out. I really, I was really believing it for a minute, because Vidian was like, you already know that you can't defeat me. Like, I'm more powerful than you. There's nothing that you can do that can even damage me. And Kanan says to him, maybe I do. And it says like he's like feeling for where he keeps his lightsaber. And I was like, oh my God, he's going to do it. Like I was just, I wanted him to just take his lightsaber out and just slash Vidian in half like so bad. Like it really had me going. But he ends up not doing it because he's like, once I do that, I can't really undo that. So I pretty much, you know, it. I understand why he didn't do it because everyone would have seen and it's like that's kind of like a card you can only play once you know so I get it why he didn't do it but oh I was really wanting him to so bad so Sloan is she gave the order to arrest Vidian and TIE fighters are shooting at the forge or trying to stop him stop the detonation like pretty much pulling out all the stops to try to get a handle on this guy and so because the TIE fighters are shooting at the ship there's destruction going on and a like a big catwalk thing falls and it's about to land on Kanan and Hera and really the only thing that they can do is Kanan has to use the force to stop the catwalk from smashing them no one else saw other than Hera because Vidian's already gone at this point when this happens Hera's kind of like okay that explains a lot because like with the way that Kanan has been just trying to keep his head down the way that he still gets involved even though he's trying to not get involved it just like makes a lot of sense from the limited information that she does have about the Jedi. And later on, we do see her thinking about how like there's been times where Kanan was pulling off things that seemed kind of like superhuman that like normal people wouldn't be able to pull off. And so it does. She once she sees him use the force, she's kind of like, OK, yeah, that that does kind of like make sense knowing what I know about guy and what I love about this moment so much is and I feel like I bring up this quote a lot lately but it's because it's like a great quote but like in the Obi-Wan Kenobi TV show when the Grand Inquisitor says the Jedi code is like an itch they can't help it that I feel like also applies to Kanan so well because throughout this whole book Kanan keeps saying I am not getting involved like I don't help people like I'm, I'm not saving anybody's skin but my own but like multiple times when it comes down to it, he does get involved and he does help people. He can't not do it. And as Vidian is getting away, he ends up passing Skelly and Skelly is still alive. He still has his little like backpack of bombs and he actually throw he sacrifices himself to like throw the bomb at Vidian and blow up the forager. Kanan and Zaluna and Hera, they're all on a escape pod so they see the forager blowing up as they're like flying away from it and as they're watching the explosion Hera's like well maybe like that landing bay must have taken a hit from the star destroyer and Kanan says no that was Skelly and because he's able to feel it in the force and Zaluna's like if well if you didn't see it how could you know that and Hera puts it together like how Kanan knows and she's like he just knows and that was just so impactful to me the fact that, you know, this whole book, Skelly has been a loose cannon. He's been just causing chaos without any really, like, sense of direction. But in his last moments, he is able to really do the thing that is the most important that counts, that if Skelly wasn't helping them, Count Vidian might have gotten away and might have still been able to detonate the explosions and blow up the moon. Because... Vidian is the one that had the control of the detonation. The fact that in his last moments, Skelly was actually able to be successful in achieving his goal that he had been kind of floundering at up until this point was just very moving. And just the way that 
that has been set up throughout this whole book and how Skelly was eventually able to really do some real damage and make a real impact and the way that Kanan was able to know and recognize that by using the force I just found that very powerful after this the moon is saved because the true results of the testing did reach the emperor so they're not going to blow up the moon now and Sloan and Dance they both end up getting promotions they have resumed mining on Gorse rather than doing it on the moon. And Saluna ends up being okay. She ends up surviving her injuries and she's starting a new life of peace. Like she's not going to be further involved in the rebellion anymore. She just kind of wants to have a quiet life now. But Hera and Kanan, of course, as we all know, they do decide to stick together. And at this point, Kanan is still like, mm, like, I don't want to get super involved, but like, I'll be like your ship crew. And of course, like we all know where that's going to go if you've watched Rebels, but oh my god, I I really, the ending of this book, it was one of the most powerful endings to a Star Wars novel that I can think of. Like it's definitely got to be like in the top. And the way that John Jackson Miller just pulled this off and put these little things throughout the story to make this ending as powerful as it was. I was, I mean, I was like very moved by this. So this book, it got me very excited for seeing Hera again in the Ahsoka series and kind of seeing what's going to happen with her character and how her character might have changed from the last time that we saw her in Rebels too. So she's just a great character. She is focused. She cares about doing the right thing. And she's a really great example of a character that is able to balance those things. So it is one of the reasons that I just love her so much as a character. I'm excited to see her in the Ahsoka series and see how she's going to be in live action. And if you have not watched Rebels yet, you've got to watch it before the Ahsoka series. It sounds like based on lots and lots of things that I've heard that the Ahsoka series is going to be very connected to that show. So I'm excited to see like in what ways that's going to be handled and how that's going to work. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I am going to be revisiting other books that might tie into the Ahsoka series in some way, whether it has to do with characters or events or whatever. So keep an eye out for those future videos that are going to be coming out. But thanks so much for watching y'all and I hope y'all have a great rest of your day. Bye guys.